सर नमस्ते सुब्रत बाबू सुबह नहीं है जस्ट स्टार्ट हाँ यस ही हैविंग सम प्रॉब्लम्स और यू जस्ट स्टार्ट ओके 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 वी शुड स्टार्ट नाउ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू ऑल व्यूअर्स वेलकम टू द सेकंड लेक्चर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार सीरीज टुडे एम्स प्रोफेसर इन the school of culture society and history aarhus university denmark will deliver a lecture on when pandemic change the world and when they don't we are grateful to you professor sir for joining us live from denmark professor brimens is an eminent health historian he has worked on tuberculosis and vaccination in fact covid 19 19 is a global pandemic it is a great predicament to the entire human race the common man is grappling with the dust to the new normality what should be the order of life on earth how to live with the these are the fundamental questions we haunt everyone us of every one of us today social scientists health historians are looking for answers to all these questions in this context today's lecture will reveal the change in human behavior and world order in the post pandemic phase i hope professor brimens will offer some insights to this predicament i once again welcome you sir to this lecture series organized by ravens university thank you Over to Professor Nandar. Yeah, Pradeepji, would you like to say something? No, I will only say good morning to everybody, and I take this opportunity to welcome our honourable Vice Chancellor, Sir Professor Ishan Kumar Patra, to this function. Who is there? He has been the chief patron and main motivator for carrying on this international webinar series. Am I audible, sir? Or yeah, yeah, absolutely, fantastic. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes uh, go ahead. Professor Remens will definitely deliver a brilliant lecture. We are very eagerly looking forward to it. Uh, and without wasting further time, I think we can go ahead and emphasize on his um, uh, talk. And before that, 
uh, I, I would uh, would be honored if Professor Ishan Kumar Patra would speak a few lines uh, on the seminar or address the gathering. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, sir. Sir. Okay. Yes. Good morning, uh, good morning, Neil, and good morning, uh, all the faculty of Pravinsa University, the participants, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is definitely a very uh, difficult time, and uh, people are um, looking forward to both uh, uh, good and bad after this pandemic uh, disappears. And uh, people are asking so many questions to themselves. What will be the future of uh, themselves, of their country, of the continent, of their world, the earth on which they are living? We are into uh, the biotech and infotech era that we all know. And possibly the pandemic that we are also facing is a, is a believe it or not, is an outcome of what... Uh, uh, Bio, biotech and infotech we people are doing and uh, man possibly um, is one who creates and destroys everything for himself i was uh, a few months back uh, reading a book by harare what he wrote about uh, 21 lessons for the 21st century in the very introductory chapter he wrote one thing i quote uh, quote, the revolution in biotech and infotech will give us control of the world inside us and will enable us to engineer and manufacture life. We will learn how to design brains, extend lives, and kill thoughts at our discretion. He continues to write, nobody knows what the consequences will be. This is important. And then he continues again to write, humans are always far better in inventing tools than using them wisely. That is exactly what is very important. And anything that we did in terms of engineering life, and we engineered the, the genome, we started engineering everything, and the coronavirus, the COVID-19, is also a engineered stuff from a lab or if we believe it is not from a lab then from a very difficult mode of living that we have accepted man um, millions and billions years of back was hunting and eating without frying them or without burning them without processing them and now people again have started in china or other countries eating fresh meat from the wild the wild animals carrying all these that has led to either of these situations we do not know what is the truth we are still investigating into it either of these has given us what we are having today but because we do not understand the complexity of our own minds that is what he continues to write the changes we will make might upset our mental systems to such an extent that it too might break down so what I told in one of the neuroscience meetings uh, just a couple of days back is that I said you in times to come after pandemic, you may need more of psychiatrists than cardiologists because people are really being stressed out. And today morning I, I sent a small clipping about not small about five minutes, a poet uh, writes about what is happening today and what for we are dying. The worst thing uh, I am dying for, I have not hugged a man for five months now. Mm. I really want to hug everybody. Can you imagine what kind of mental stress it brings? Besides my mother and wife who stays with me, possibly I have never gone to anybody more closer than a feet or, a, or maybe five feet or six feet. So a man who is a social being who lives to live and love, has been deprived of many things with this pandemic. And this possibly is the basis of our living. And what we are going to have is, we are going to have many, many other things. Generally, what has uh, happened in our uh, 
societies following any pandemic is it has collapsed empires it has weakened powers and created social changes and brought about wars or brought down wars so a pandemic is capable of doing so many things which could be taken as a positive uh, turn in human life or it could be a negative turn in human life what we are going to face post pandemic is unemployment depression in our economies radical changes from good to bad or bad to good will it reverse the trends of globalization to isolation we worked for almost 40 50 years now past 22 decades we have spent all our money all our energy all our thinking towards globalization and now what i see is it has come to isolation we have isolated ourselves in a family in a room and we are going to isolate ourselves in our village or state we are going to isolate ourselves in our country and maybe we will really reverse it will it be a reversal from globalization to isolation we do not know because we do not know how long it is going to uh, live on this earth some scientists are predicting that this pandemic will remain for 2 years if it is not living for 2 years anyway but its impact will continue to be there for at least 5 years and what is going to do is it will influence our international uh, cooperation international uh, conflicts will come up because our uh, commitments to other countries will change when the commitment changes conflicts appear what is going to happen is the global trade will be affected many things that we designed planned and uh, wanted to sell outside the country will not be sold our social distancing may come to distancing between countries the definition of safety has changed and will it remain changed forever i do not know it may reverse our activities from global to isolated that will be what i i would i would call this as from anti globalization to will come to anti immigration people will not like to move it may be very much beneficial for the youth in one way but it will be very difficult for them in another way if they wanted to sell out their talent in a better price in a better place they are now going to be challenged what is going to happen is there will be no crowds anywhere people will like to run away from crowds crowds there will be no theaters no opera no ground where people would like to display their talent people would be seeing them on a small screen of the mobile or the or the tv or the or the laptop and it will become a contactless world and what i have come to understand is yesterday i wanted to put some money into the bank in cash they said we in the bank also they had to tell me that we do not accept cash because we do not know how much of <laughs> virus will come through the notes that you are giving us you can imagine that in a contactless world we will need more psychiatrists than cardiologists that is what i said a different order of life is going to come and are we preparing ourselves for that there will be family centric life we already are suffering from this issue of having nuclear families and now within the nuclear family again there is going to be distance between people the son may not like to sit with the father the father may not like to come closer to the daughter in law things can change things can really change very fast besides this our community has been affected very badly there are good things happening but beside just if you just flip the good thing you could very well see the naked truth of the bad thing that is going to come up the health and economy that we are thinking has been affected very badly undoubtedly there is uh, the skies anyway have become very clear there is dramatic clarity in our skies now it has they have become blue and the decrease in pollution uh, all these are very increasing now and the carbon dioxide emission has gone down humans are in in and animals are out but what has happened now the stray animals are dying animals who very much depended you know if you go to a uh, indian 
temple, you'll find a lot of monkeys coming to you for food. They are in number, a great number, thousands of them. And they have been fed by the visitors. Now they are not getting food. One of the environmental biologists of India has now put up a small uh, note somewhere and with a, with, a, uh, with a video clipping, he has seen there is cannibalism in those monkeys now because there is no food. Imagine that. And there could be a situation when we, we will ourselves get into that state. Why? Because a lot of food that has been created by the farmers are not going to the farm. They are dumping them. Farmers have come to a state of great sorrow, great fear, great poverty. And it is believed that many of them may commit suicide even because they don't get back anything. For the whole year, whatever they did, the fruit or the vegetable or the, the crop that they are getting is not being sold. It doesn't go out. Nobody is buying them. And what is happening is the animal farms, imagine how many, uh, there was one uh, small video clipping in WhatsApp. Nobody knows who came and dumped them. There are billions of chicks in South Indian roadside. They just <clears> dumped <throat> the truck and ran away because nobody is there to buy them. Nobody is there to take care of them. And what is what is what more is, we are thinking, we are feeling that everything has been gone from a non from a disordered environment to an ordered environment. The point is, when we start doing everything that we were doing earlier, then it's going to get a bigger blow on our face. If we have been able to adjust to a disorder condition. And suddenly we've got an order condition and this order condition will again become disordered. That is the question that everybody has to ask and address. As a neuroscientist, what I believe is, I believe now what people need more is the vaccine, the drugs, but equally people to talk, to remove the loneliness from the mind of people. It may so happen that we will have a society full of mentally sick people. Imagine what kind of environment that is going to give anybody. I'm pretty sure I just posted a uh, poster in my uh, official group in the university. The Bits Pilani is now holding a uh, webinar involving about 20 countries where people are trying to think how the smart cities will look after the pandemic. What, what they are going to do with these smart cities. What they are going to do with it. Are they really functional now? The traffic lamps, <laughs> the traffic poles, the traffic uh, mechanism, or anything that they had, are they doing any any job? Are they in order? They have been, they are not being used for a pretty long time. How would we are going to really behave in a post-pandemic world where these smart cities will have their different uh, uh, look? And what I uh, have been told by people uh, from uh, UK, my friend, they've been now telling, anyway, they love to live in suburban areas. And what they're saying is people are moving. And India, it has come up now. Everybody will like to move from a city to the village, to live away from the crowd. And now imagine what will happen. The entire ecology, the entire sociology, the entire psychology of the villages will change. People who did not know how to live in villages, they'll come in. There will be a hodgepodge there. There will be a lot of mixing and whether the villagers will accept this or whether the city dwellers can go and stay in those villages in those conditions are big questions. Then we will think about making smart villages and the smart villages will be no different than smart cities. So these are big challenges. Big challenges. I am talking of human level challenge. I am not talking about science. I am not talking about biological things that is going to happen. I am not talking about the brain changes that is going to come up. I am not talking about the international changes, global changes that are going to come up. But I know at individual level we are going to face all this. And I really respect those uh, authorities who have been able to analyze the history and have been able to write books like this one, uh, what the lessons that we have got and how you should be living in 21st century. What I find is this book really it has been written very nicely. What he says, everything is coming true now and we are facing the situation. So I welcome such discussions. I am very happy that the history department has put up such wonderful uh, series of lectures, uh, such eminent professors 
who have been not thinking only about their country, they are thinking about the world as a whole, the humanity as a whole. And I'm sure these lectures are going to be very useful. And today we are going to have a very nice lecture from me. So all the best and uh, enjoy the lectures. I'll be there. And before anybody really snatches me off my chair, I'll continue to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor, for agreeing to address our people. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Patra, for your kind uh, observations and absolutely fascinating observations talking about uh, you know, globalization. And I remember, I recollect, uh, uh, the first talk was uh, by the Chakrabarti, who tried to problematize this issue of you know, global warming and uh, globalization. And now the whole focus of the humanity is on globalization, as we also talk in terms of isolation. So this is precisely the moment when we are also again going to, uh, you know, hear from Niels, one of our good friends, friends of this department, friends of this university, with whom, uh, with which university we have a memorandum, memorandum of understanding since uh, 2017. And he has kindly agreed to be with us. And uh, as you know, uh, for the viewers, uh, those who are not slightly familiar with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Neil's uh, trajectory as an academician, of course, Google is the best uh, answer, and he can also directly speak to you. But let me do a bit of, you know, fill in the gaps, saying that, you know, he's a very uh, enormously cited as historian. So he is an enormously cited health historian across the globe and one of the most significant, uh, his significant uh, uh, interventions into the works of tuberculosis and uh, smallpox is widely acknowledged. And uh, in fact, uh, his recent engagement remains in terms of uh, trying to understand some of the basic uh, policy strategies adopted by health organizations uh, like WHO. In fact, uh, he is currently engaged with a kind of uh, research which tries to look at the life experiences, uh, his, his own life, his experiences, his career. Uh, as a doctor, uh, he is uh, no other than uh, Abdul Malhar, who was the director general of WHO from 70, uh, 1973 to 1988, this 15 years. And uh, what he tries to, what Niels tries to argue that uh, uh, I mean experiences while working with the tubercular control in India immensely saved his ideas, saved his views in formulating uh, Muller's very critical intervention at that point of time when he tried to come up with the slogan that health for all by 2000. So that's something is very interesting uh, because now that we are confronted with a kind of situation when the whole uh, the, you know, health establishment, the world global health establishment represented by WHO is under uh, daily scrutiny by one and all, by everyone. There is a quotidian scrutiny of this uh, health organization. Suddenly, we never bothered to think about such organizations as we don't bother to think about UN or the Security General Council, what is happening. It's not uh, the kind of uh, attention, I mean, usual attention uh, with which an individual, uh, you know, uh, some someone at the popular level, someone who is uh, a common man doesn't think much about those organizations. But suddenly this pandemic or this situation that we are in, whether even lockdown or shutdown or in any form, we have been forced, at least we are spending at least a little bit of time to think about what WHO advisory is today. I mean, whether there is a visit uh, this advisory about WHO, about airborne or not, whether WHO should visit China, how uh, do you justify uh, Trump's, you know, you know, vitrolics against uh, WHO at the moment? All these ideas have suddenly, uh, you know, persuaded us to look at WHO. And we are also having a talk from uh, two of the very eminent people, health historians who are coming shortly, and next week will be who are partly associated with WHO's organizations. And uh, they will be also talking about these ideas to a large extent. But uh, uh, my uh, way of looking at this talk and its importance of this talk remains in, in, in the fact that uh, 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 
by historically looking at some of the ideas and some of the policies which malher at that point of time uh, formulated for who could also give us some kind of understanding the way who has grown, come up uh, come to be saved by today and what is its reach what is its implications for other countries for other nation states that is something that is very interesting and as we also as, as you can also note as you can also note uh, is there any problem it's getting fractured so uh, uh, his very interesting uh, book which came up in 2016 called uh, the language hope state and international assistance in 20th century india uh, where he talked about uh, uh, the dynamics of uh, tubercular control in india and uh, he tried i mean that that is one way of looking at uh, nationalist health missions as well as also global health interventions these two dimensions are very important because to understand this particular one because as we have very clearly articulated from the beginning that the uh, the webinar series is wedded to one of the major objectives of understanding this particular moment from different uh, uh, perspectives whether it is an anthropologist or the historian whether it is a public health ethicist whether it is a biologist or a geologist all about environmentalist all of them should bring in their ideas so that we understand this moment very clearly very you know significantly and make some critical interventions in in into the whole uh, you know mode of policy formulation something of that sort so uh, neils is could be very important at this point of time to share his uh, understanding to a larger audience where we also try to uh, you know get ready with our own understanding of who the way it functions today or the, the way other nations nation states try to have a dialogue or conversation with who these things can be made more clearer once we have uh, you know ideas which uh, remains otherwise in health history books can come to the public domain gets discussed gets uh, you know you know debated so that we get to know so thank you uh, nils uh, both as a friend as a very eminent professor of health uh, history and uh, as a very great human being and also most another significant feature of uh, neils is that uh, he is a great indian lover and his interest lies in both studying colonial indian history and danish uh, history that is danish colonial history so he is trying to see the linkages between uh, denmark and india in, starting from the colonial period so he has visited many parts of uh, india and all, including orissa uh, in uh, in balasore so that's something that that makes uh, his presence more uh, you know unique uh, for us both uh, today and also because of this mou he is virtually present with us all the time and uh, i remember that he he has a deep seated understanding about indian nationalism too and about gandhi when we are co teaching a course in denmark to students his interventions about gandhian nationalism was so superb i was really drawn to his uh, arguments is drawn to his kind of the way people from outside india look at us look at gandhi or look at people like uh, so who really the uh, create lot of difference so thank you nils without wasting uh, time and we are all looking forward to your views uh, observations and uh, you know, comments or and also this great talk thank you very much yes thank you very much uh, can you hear me yeah absolutely yeah very good uh, thank you very much professor ananda thank you very much uh, honorable vice chancellor for inviting me to 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 present uh, at your uh, uh, great university in in uh, uh, in katak uh, i'm i'm very honored to be part of this series which i find a very excellent initiative um my the t the, the title of my uh, lecture today is when pandemics change the world and when they don't uh It is not difficult for historians to identify major outbreaks of disease that change the course of history. Uh, the most obvious candidate is uh, the mainly viral diseases that decimated the native Americans in the so-called Columbian Exchange. The virtual breakdown of native American societies had many causes, but immunological and epidemiological factors were crucial. had the immune systems of the indigenous people of america been more resilient towards old world microbes the history of america africa and eventually the entire globe would have been 
significantly different. Another candidate is the so-called Black Death in medieval Europe, when plague took away up to half of Europe's population. According to some historians, there are direct links from the plague of the 14th century to the so-called Great Divergence between uh, Europe and Asia in the late 18th. The massive loss of life strengthens both the standards of life for the general population and their bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the elite. In some versions of this argument, the strong peasantry, uh, the post-plague strong peasantry in Europe ensured a despotism-free Europe of comparatively weak and competing states, which was conducive to the industrial breakthrough. In other, and uh, I think recently more influential versions of this argument, uh, the strong peasantry uh, created a so-called high-wage economy, which centuries later facilitated innovation and industrialization in Europe, particularly in England. Now, um, even if we do not find these explanations particularly convincing, and they are full of problems and issues that could be discussed, it is hard to deny that the 14th century plague um, changed the course of European history and presumably also had at least a profound impact on global history. But history also, and perhaps more often, contains examples of epidemic and pandemic diseases that did not fundamentally change the world. I tend to believe, for instance, that the great influenza, despite its enormous death toll, did not change the world. Another and well-researched example, to which I shall return shortly, is the third plague pandemic. Now, I am obviously not saying that these pandemics were not important. They were hugely important, and, I had, and they had an enormous impact. But I will argue, and that will be my central argument uh, today, that they mainly accentuated or consolidated developments that were already present. Let me illustrate this with some examples, a few examples from the third plague pandemic. Plague emerged in South China in 1894, and from the busy harbor of Hong Kong, the bacteria spread with the rats in the cargo holds of steamships. By contrast to the coronavirus, which has encompassed the globe in a few months, traveling with tourists and uh, business people on planes, uh, the plague took years uh, to reach its most remote destinations. Plague emerged in South... Uh, 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 sorry, a plague was not nearly as uh, contagious as the coronavirus, but once you caught the disease, mortality was alarming up to 80%. The third plague pandemic hit the world unevenly. It took away millions of lives in the global south, while in Europe, the victims could be counted in thousands. In North America, they could be counted in hundreds. It was a pandemic which was inherently loyal to the extremely unequal world in which it appeared. The third plague pandemic also illustrates that infectious diseases are always social diseases. They hit the poor those who live in crowded conditions, and those who cannot escape or isolate. It happened around 1900. We see it happening again today. When the plague emerged, Western scientific medicine was full of confidence. Spurred on by the bacteriological revolution of the 1880s, scientists were confident that they could identify the microorganism that, that caused plague. And they were right. Within a year, the plague bacteria was identified almost simultane simultaneously by the Swiss French Alexander Yersin, associated with the Pasteur Institute, and the Japanese Kitasara Shibasaburu, who had worked with Pasteur's rival. Hello? I think I was cut off. Is that correct? Slightly, sir. Yeah. Should I just continue or should I start go back? Please continue. Yeah. Um, I will. 
identifying the bacteria uh, and associating and associating it with rats was, however, only part uh, only partly explained uh, uh, the root of infec infection in plague. It would take more than 10 years before the rat flea was identified as the crucial carrier of the disease. This meant that it was still erroneously assumed that bubonic plague could spread directly from human to human. And this led to unfortunate uh, strategies in the attempt to stop the disease. The International Sanitary Conference, which we can see as a kind of a precursor to the present day WHO, recommended isolation, disinfection and destruction of property. And to a limit ext limited extent, it also recommended rat control. Now, isolation was largely ineffective while disinfection and destruction of property was actually counterproductive as it caused infected rats to flee and thereby spread the infection further. Only rat control made sense. Now, plague hit Mumbai in 1896. It was the worst possible place. As India's leading port, the metropolis was well connected with shipping routes across the ocean and railway lines into the Indian hinterland. Moreover, Mumbai housed a large concentration of poor people with weakened immune systems in overcrowded slums. Eventually, the plague claimed around 12 million lives in India, and of course it spread much beyond Mumbai. Um, perhaps the 12 million lives lost in India uh, comes up to about 75% of the total uh, number of lives lost in the third plague pandemic. And when I say that the third plague pandemic did not change the course of history, it might be because its effect throughout India has is still, I think, poorly understood. If we add the about 18 million lives uh, that the great uh, influenza uh, took away, uh, India lost around 10% of its population in just 20 years. But the effects of this uh, massive loss of human life, I think, is still poorly understood and it remains uh, understudied. What is well studied, however, is the political impact of the plague in the western Indian cities of Mumbai and Pune. In these cities, the British authorities had two problems. Their rule enjoyed very little legitimacy among the Indian population and the interventions they used against the plague were largely futile or even harmful. Armed with the new bacteriological knowledge, the British authorities believed that they could handle the outbreak through draconian measures that paid absolutely no attention to Indian sentiments. Poor Indians saw their position go up in smoke and their relatives forcibly taken into hospital or to hospitals from which only corpses came out. This situation was, of course, a gift to the emerging nationalist movement, which was particularly strong and particularly radical in Western India in the 1890s. Violent clashes emerged, culminating with the assassination of the particularly heavy-handed plague commissioner in Pune. Eventually, the British had to back down and collaborate more with the Indian elite in their attempt to confront the plague. The plague has been constructed, therefore, as a moment, as a successful moment, you can even say, in the rise of the Indian nationalist movement. So the important point in the present context is, as I see it, that the tension inherent in imperial rule and the rise of the nationalist movement was already there in India when the plague arrived. The plague consolidated or boosted a development that was already happening. Now, if we move to Cape Town in South Africa, we can see a similar process, even if the outbreak there was much smaller and the developments enhanced by the plague were quite different. Plague came to Cape Town during the Boer Wars and the city witnessed an influx of Africans. At the same time, ideas about segregating the African, the colored and the white inhabitants began to simmer. This time, I think, 
the plague served as a lever for the idea of racial segregation. Racial segregation was a political idea, but it was nurtured by pseudo-medical ideas about African as a particularly filthy and disease-ridden race. It was well known that plague was caused by a bacteria and associated with rats. Still, and despite this knowledge, the notion of an African race was used as a scapegoat and the epidemic served as a pretext to forcibly remove the African population to a sewage ground outside the town proper. Ironically, one result of this segregation was that Africans were actually less hard hit by the plague than other groups in the area. My point is, once again, that plague did not invent racism or racial segregation. It provided an occasion to reinforce racist ideas and apply them to practical politics. So if you can say that in a way the plague in Mumbai can be linked because it boosted the nationalist movement to Indian independence in 1947, the plague in Cape Town can be linked to the introduction of the apartheid laws in 1948. Finally, if we move further west to San Francisco, we see similar social dynamics. In this important harbor city of 350,000 inhabitants, that is 3.5 lakhs, and a Chinatown of some 10,000, there was a constant fear of getting the plague from China. Since the plague had originated in China, it was, and here there are some obvious parallels uh, to COVID-19, it was constructed as a Chinese disease. And the Chinese were seen as particularly dangerous carriers of infection. Again, a parallel to what has happened in some parts of the world recently. The larger context was one in which reference was frequently made am among uh, wide inhabitants of the United States to the Yarrow Peril and one uh, which saw attempts to stop Chinese migration through legislation. I think you can say that a widespread anti-Chinese racism in San Francisco was ready to exploit the, or utilize the plague when it eventually arrived in San Francisco in the spring of the year 1900. Based on one suspicious death in Chinatown in March, a harsh quarantine was immediately imposed on Chinatown. It had, however, to be lifted after a few days. People might have been more afraid of the Chinese than of the plague, but it was, after all, not possible to close down an entire neighborhood based on one unconfirmed case of plague. Decision makers then tried to reimpose a cordon sanitaire on Chinatown and even suggested to demolish the entire area. But they faced resistance from several quarters. They faced resistance from the Chinese community, of course, they faced resistance from parts of the local press. They faced resistance from commercial interests. And they also faced resistance from the courts. It was the courts that forced the city authorities to lift its sanctions against Chinatown because its measures were judged to be discriminatory. discriminatory. Then, as now, the United States was a country where individual rights triumph over collective public health measures. It arguably made more sense in 1900 than it does today. The first outbreak of plague in San Francisco came to an end in 1904 with 121 deaths. The Chinese community had won the legal battle against quarantines, but they lost a larger one because in the same year, that is in 1904, the Anti-Immigration Chinese Exclusion Act from 1882 was made permanent. From 1904, Chinese were no longer, uh, in, in, in the very long future, no longer uh, permitted to enter the United, to immigrate into the United States. The plague returned, however, after the great earthquake in 1906. But this time the disease was fought in a more sensible and more successful manner. Between the two outbreaks of plague in San Francisco, the authorities seems to have understood that if you want to control plague, you should fight rats, not minorities. My point, of course, is the same as for Mumbai and Cape Town. 
The plague did not change history in San Francisco. It reinforced trends most prominent, uh, most, most prominent, prominently the growing anti-Chinese racism trends that were already there. So, let me end this presentation by claiming that the COVID-19 pandemic is more like the third plague pandemic than like the Columbian Exchange or the Black Death. It is, and we will also come to see it uh, in, in a few years' time as historians, hugely important. And it will have severe consequences, and uh, we have just heard uh, the Vice Chancellor talking about uh, uh, some of them. But it will not, I will argue, fundamentally change history. Instead, it will speed up trends that were already gaining momentum before the federal incidents in Wuhan in late 2019. So my argument would, would be that the plague will have consequences, but the most important consequences would be, would be to speed up things that are already happening. I would also like to emphasize that I think that COVID-19 will probably have different consequences depending on the specific context in which it appears. I mean, we can see today that COVID-19 is likely to have very different consequences in, say, Denmark, India, and Brazil, because the uh, specific the regional context in which it appears, the way the political authorities uh, engage with the, with, the, with the health crisis and so on and so forth, they are different. And so the plague, or sorry, not the plague, but the disease will also have different uh, uh, consequences. But let me just briefly uh, suggest some not very original uh, possible general developments that we might see uh, emerging from the present uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and I will talk very briefly about two of them and a little more about the last one. The first one is, and we have already also heard, heard uh, that a, a little earlier, more nationalism. It's a difficult case, I think, because virtually all outbreaks of infectious disease tend to enhance the feeling of solidarity in close and familiar communities. People shield from the distant and the unknown when something from outside and abroad uh, uh, threatens them. Yet nationalism was on the rise, at least in Europe, before COVID-19, and it seems very likely that these nationalist tendencies will be further strengthened by the epidemic. And it seems clear, at least, that critical infrastructure and the production of certain medical commodities will be taken home as an example of what I think will be a limited uh, deglobalization in the wake of COVID-19. It is more difficult to judge the fate of not nationalism, but nationalist populism. It is normally good for populists if you can convert a health crisis into a severe national crisis. But the likes of uh, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson and Bolsonaro in Brazil have mismanaged the epidemic so badly that they might not benefit from sort of the emergence of, emergence of something that could be constructed as a national crisis. They might not benefit from that at all. In India, I think Modi has taken the pandemic more seriously than other populists. But I think, and you will know much more about that, but what I hear from India is that the situation in India is in is severe and it might still spiral out of control. Uh, you you are you are you are in uh, you are in a difficult time, and it's very. Um, uh, I mean, it's very frightening to think of what might happen. Um, I hope the best, of course. The second uh, thing I would talk about is enhanced digital surveillance. Now, enhanced or more digital surveillance has been on the rise for some time, but has mainly been associated, outside China at least, with the non-state commercial interest of Facebook, Apple, and Google. Now, while the technology to survey people digitally is getting more and more sophisticated, it can now be used for the state, or sorry, by the state for a purportedly laudable cause, protecting the health of the population. And I think that resistance, the resistance that there might be uh, to digital control is likely to weaken. In the future, we will, in the name of health, accept that the state knows much more about us and where we have been and who we've been in contact with. 
I think this could have, it's not my field of expertise, I will not say more about it, but I think it could have some very important implications for the future. And my third and last point, and the point that I will talk a little bit more about, is the rise of China. I guess that COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis, will be used by future historians as a case brilliantly illustrating the march towards a world increasingly dominated by China. Again, I will argue, COVID-19 did not cause the rise of China, but COVID-19 has accelerated its rise and it has also made its rise much more clear if, uh, to us. The authoritarian Chinese state has a much better record in controlling the virus than the liberal American state. Even if the Chinese numbers must be, must be read with extreme caution and the Chinese have used measures against its own population that I think brings back to our minds scenes from Mumbai in 19, uh, sorry, in 1896. Very, very harsh treatment uh, uh, of, of their own population. But I think it's interesting that despite being the original epicenter of the pandemic, China has actually been able to capitalize uh, on COVID-19 in its international relations. The US, on the other hand, have lost out significantly under the incompetent leadership of Donald Trump. I am thinking particularly of the way the rivaling, today's rivaling superpowers, which is obviously China and, and the US, um, uh, have negotiated, negotiated the WHO during the crisis. In late January, Director General Tetros went to Beijing, and I am convinced that he there struck a deal with Xi Jinping. The WHO would get access to and collaboration from China if the WHO would abstain from sincerely problematizing the Chinese efforts to control the virus. The result of this meeting and the deal that I guess was struck during this meeting was the February joint mission led by Bruce Aylward. And let me quote a few passages from the report of that mission, that February mission to China. The first quote is, from the report is, in the face of a previously unknown virus, China has rolled out perhaps the most ambitious, agile and aggressive disease containment effort in history. Another quote, as striking has been the uncompromising rigor of strategy application that proved to be a hallmark in every setting and context where it was examined. There has also been a relentless focus on improving key performance indicators, for example, constantly enhancing the speed of case detection, isolation, and early treatment. The implementation of these containment measures had been supported, has been supported and enabled by the innovative and aggressive use of cutting edge technologies, from shifting to online medical platforms for routine care and schooling to the use of 5G platforms to support rural response operation. And a final quote, by extension, the reduction that has been achieved in the force of COVID-19 infection in China has also played a significant role in protecting the global community and creating a stronger first line of defense against international spread. Containing this outbreak, however, has come at, a great, at great cost and sacrifice by China and its people in both human and material terms. Reading these uh, quotes, I guess you will agree with me that it seems that the Chinese authorities could not themselves have written a better report, a report that was more supportive of their own efforts. Now, I do not blame Director General Tetris for striking this deal with China, given the circumstances in early 2020, where the coronavirus was a potentially global threat, but a threat that was still mainly confined within China. And it was also in early, the case was also in early 2020 that Donald Trump was actually very supportive of the Chinese efforts at this stage. It was crucial for WHO to ensure access to and collaboration with China. But I think it is obvious that in this situation, China actually managed to score a diplomatic victory. If we move to May, when the 
World Health Organization held its annual World Health <laughs> Assembly, Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping cleverly, I think, used WHO as a stage to express global leadership to promise generous support to fight the coronavirus and to explicitly reach out to African countries. I mean, if you have time, do go to the internet and watch uh, Xi Jinping's address to the, to the specialist address to the World Health Assembly and see how he he employs or utilizes this, this capitalize on this uh, situation to position China as a new global uh, world leader in health, promising a lot of money for uh, fighting the, the COVID-19 and uh, very specifically talking about how China will support for strategic interest, of course, he didn't say that, but that was the obvious background uh, that they would that they would support African countries. Now, what did the American administration do in relation to the uh, World Health Assembly back in May? Well, they declined to speak, although they were invited to do so. They threatened to stop paying and to eventually leaving the WHO. Uh, you know, they spectacularly. They spectacularly failed to move an anti-Chinese resolution. They isolated themselves and got, in my analysis, they got nothing out of it. And this is, I think, despite the fact that some of the criticism towards the Chinese handling of the coronavirus virus and COVID-19 is arguably very valid and also potentially damaging for the Chinese efforts to capitalize on the situation. I mean, my point is that there are things in the American criticism of WHO, uh, sorry, not so much of WHO, but of the, of, 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 of the Chinese uh, uh, actions that are valid and, sh and should be investigated. Uh, but they managed to basically screw it all up. Uh, Trump actually sent a letter to Director General Tetras uh, on the 18th of May, uh, in which uh, he uh, simply stated, and I quote from this letter, which is also available on, on, on the internet, uh, he wrote, the only way forward for the World Health Organization is if it can actually demonstrate independence from China. My administration has already started discussions with, with you on how to reform the organization, but action is needed quickly. We do not have time to waste. That is why it is my duty as President of the United States to inform you that if the World Health Organization does not commit to major substantive improvement within the next 30 days, I will make my temporary freeze of United States funding to the World Health Organization permanent and reconsider our membership of the organization. So what Trump is doing is that he's threatening to, to permanently he had, he had already stopped the payment to WHO uh, temporarily. Now he threatens to do it uh, on a permanent basis. And he's also threatening to leave the organization, something that he actually announced that the U.S. would do only 10 days later, not even 30 days later, but 10 days later. Mm -hmm. So what I think is uh, interesting in this quote from that letter is that the letter does not even reveal what the United States actually want WHO to do. WHO cannot from this letter see what they have to improve in order to satisfy the American government. Now, why? Because I don't think the American administration actually knew what they wanted from it. Substantive improvement within the next 30 days could mean anything or nothing. It didn't give the WHO a clue as to what actually to do. Now, to me, this evidence depicts a China that plays the international game cleverly and with a clear goal, uh, and a United States as a state's administration that does not have a plan for what it wants from the WHO or from international disease control in general, but only uses it as a cover-up for domestic failure. Now, this story about how much better the Chinese negotiated the WHO during the corona crisis fits, I think, hand in glove with the general rise of China in the first decades of the 21st century. And of course, the rise of China has been emerging for uh, uh, several decades uh, uh, by now. So, and this will be my final point, just as the plague boosted nationalist protest and resistance in India and reinforced racist thinking and practice in Cape Town and San Francisco, COVID-19 will accelerate the ongoing transformation into a world with a much stronger China and a much weaker United States. 
Even if COVID-19 does not, like the third plague pandemic, change the world, it tells us a lot about the changes that are actually going on. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, thank you, Nils, uh, for this wonderful uh, elaboration of uh, the points that you have been reflecting on. So without, uh, I mean, this is the time that uh, we need to also engage with few of the observations which have already come from the viewers. And yes. also some quick uh, take on your talk uh, by one of our moderators, uh, Professor uh, Umakanta Mishra, is going to uh, share uh, his uh, reflections on this and also uh, have a quick pick up from some, some select questions from the viewers. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Means, for your thank, thank you very much for your. Thank you very much for your um, uh, brilliant presentations. Um, as you say that, you know, you also yesterday, while summing up the presentation of Professor Chakravarti, I gave a mail to you yesterday saying that fixity of meaning, fixity of words is a neurotic delusion. As per Lacan, Lacan says this famous word uh, that fixity of meaning is a neurotic delusion and therefore in an in a dynamic world uh, even though there are certain certitudes there is no fixity and as you told you three major aspects of your lecture today halves on fast that certain friends uh, which are on view in this 21st century is accelerated by COVID and two important lessons that you drew from history of plagues in Mumbai, you know, you the Chapekar brothers and the nationalist of search that we saw, one is the growth of nationalism. And the growth of nationalism in the neoliberal era that we have seen in the first decade of 21st century is now accelerated. But there are, because of differential responses of different national governments, uh, some populist government might, you know, use that resources of nationalism for their own benefit and some may be detrimental as, you know, the coming days, especially the election of United States may so. Therefore, two major accelerators that we have seen now, uh, is one is the rise of racism and we see Chinese uh, anti-Chinese feelings um, and the, the other is the rise of nationalist upsurge. But you know the benefits um, for various populist government, nationalist government would vary depending upon the kind of dynamic you know responses that various governments make. The second issue as you told is about um, the politics in WHO and the larger gamut of international politics, uh, which was adequately used by China and foolishly by United States. Uh, given these, uh, you know, insights that you gave, uh, let me also raise certain questions which have been voiced by various, um, you know, people who have been listening to your lecture. And may I um, raise certain questions um, that, that have come. One is what will be the consequence for China, especially uh, given the criticism it has received in suppressing information and its aggressive foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the adroit policies, especially with regard to WHO it pursued. What do you think 
of this. Um, what do you think of China's um, future of China, especially uh, the kind of the kind of uh, criticism it has received um, both in foreign policy fronts as well as initial suppression of information, even though it has succeeded both financially as well as you know from health perspective um, in containing uh, COVID-19. This is the first question that we have come. Up. Then there is another question regarding the future of various nation states. Especially, this has come from Sipati. Uh, can you speculate the consequence that India will see in terms of development uh, in future times? What are the opportune sectors that India can exploit? And what are these sectors which can face certain setbacks? Um, this has come, come from Sipati. We can note down these questions so that you can address them um, in total. How will we survive if this pandemic continues for, let's say, for two or three years more? And you have already said that, you know, it merely accelerated, accelerates certain process which are on. Uh, therefore, it might not change our conception of history. Um, this is your view. But nevertheless, there is a question regarding uh, about the a future of mankind, future of nation state, if pandemic continues to uh, create this psychological as well as real fears uh, that we have seen in recent days. Another question by Kamal Prasad Mahanti, what broadly speaking are the major way in which epidemics have saved modern world or it saved modern, the idea of modernity? Well, again, I'm repeating, what broadly speaking are the major ways in which epidemics have saved our view of modernity. And therefore, can we, can we break the chronological time that we have seen right from um, great acceleration of 1950 or right from the days of capitalism in 18th century? This is the broad question Kamal Prashad has raised. Then can we create a world free of pandemics given the, um, you know, technological, infotechnological and biomedical uh, advances that we have seen in the last um, century as well as in 21st century, uh, which obviously, you know, uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor has been talking about 21st uh, century relations by Harari and one of the major arguments that Harari makes is that uh, given the kind of technology that we have, we will certainly uh, we can certainly contain these pandemics provided we come together and evolve cooperation. And Harari's major focus is to evolve cooperation among groups, among nations. And as we have seen in during these pandemics, it is certainly lacking in these times. Maybe we are living in isolation and contactless world as has been uh, talked about by our vice chancellor. But Cooperation is certainly the need of the hour, which has been missing from the table of UN, from the table of WHO and international leaders. Please address to these questions. Thank you so much. May I also quickly add uh, one or two observations, uh, which is really important in the context of your um, observations and very critical observations saying that um, being a historian, uh, you really foresee a kind of challenge coming from uh, the, uh, the way nation states will uh, deal with this issue of digital control. So, uh, uh, I mean, you say that you, you don't have much expertise, but I uh, still think that uh, given the kind of uh, history you have already done uh, in, uh, in connection with uh, health histories or whatever uh, question of nationalism, uh, don't you think that uh, the challenge from people would be equally enormous and also there would be an ethical challenge from the people? So I've been thinking of a kind of new society which is on the making, uh, which, I mean, whether you call it uh, in the process of uh, making of a modern or making of a non-modern in uh, quote unquote. So it's a new society, it's a new way of imagining which is on the rise, you know, one is uh, to do uh, people, people remain, remain shut down or locked down for a long uh, period of time, time and they are digitally controlled. controlled. 
that would be a kind of critical uh, uh, articulation of their resistance somewhere. So that, that might, might also have some people have started arguing in terms of a kind, kind of moral society, society which might also come into being. That, that is one. And secondly, and now the whole question of anthropocene, let's not gloss it over. You know, that's more important as uh, Uma also rightly uh, suggested by saying that, you know, uh, the question of Marjorie, whether we talk in terms of rise of China or the different shape that America is going to uh, political shape that uh, we are likely to witness with all the major parts, and the question remains that uh, all once we realize after one year or two years that is no end to this kind of predicament, what do we do or what, how do we if the humanity try to wrestle with this uh, idea of disease, idea of infection? Or idea of lockdown. How long they will sustain that? That will give a different window to think in terms of uh, the question of planet. You know? uh, now this idea of globe uh, will be problematized, and uh, the category of planet would definitely hunt us to go beyond this globe and something to do with that. So, so we need we to get into the level of the historians, of the anthropologists, of the philosophers, of the scientists, of the biologists, of the geologists. Of thinking in terms of the local consciousness or a kind of new commons, all these ideas that uh, also remain locking at this stage, which is not very visible, which is not very, you know, uh, you know it doesn't look very clear, horizon is not still clear. But I think we need to also, I mean, that would be a, a kind of uh, change. I mean, as you said, when the pandemic do not change, I also take it as quote unquote, a pandemic like this or COVID 19 of this nature might lead uh, to a kind of situation, kind of scenario where we need to think in terms of a very strong category of planet and this idea of biodiversity. So there is a much uh, uh, sense and strength remains in terms of problematizing this idea of both isolation and globalization, all these two things uh, in a very dramatically opposite manner. But in analogy, it's not binary anymore. We need to see it as two analytical distinctly analytical categories which need to be supplemented in a very different way. But that is what I would like to also add to my to your, uh, comments on digital control and also that the uh, pandemic uh, will uh, of this nature will not change. Thank you. Should I, should I answer? Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for... Uh, yes. for yeah. uh, thank you yeah. very much for... Uh, for, uh, for for a lot of uh, uh, good questions, I had a, I had a little trouble. Yes, I'll try. Had some trouble. Uh, 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 there was some trouble with the voice of when, when, when you spoke, Chandy, and I'm also getting some some sound in my uh, headphones now. But I'll try to answer uh, uh, the questions as, as as I noted them down. First, uh, there was a good question about the consequences for China. Now, I think that what he, the, I think that what we have to uh, accept is that China have done some good things and some bad things in in, in this situation. They, I think, uh, it is clear that they will withheld information for too long. They played down the. Um, the, uh, the severeness of, 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 of this threat, but they can also point to other things where they were quite fast in actually sharing the, the genetic code of the virus with, with the world and they were, they, 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 they were, they were, they were quick to, to, to collaborate with the WHO and so on and so forth. So I think that it is a very sort of, they have a mixed record and, and you can say that they did certain things that they can, that we can, where we can criticize them, but, but they can also say, yes, but we also did uh, things where we should be, uh, that, that you should be thankful that we did. Um, and I think that overall China sh would be able to, uh, to, uh, to capitalize on this. And I think that, uh, I mean, I, I might tend to see this from a very sort of uh, Eurocentric perspective or from this perspective of a European or North American liberal uh, uh, point of view, you know, all the all the human rights violations that the Chinese government has probably done, and 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 and, and things like that. Um, but I think that if you look beyond Europe, 
And if you look to uh, Africa, for instance, uh, China just emerged as a much stronger, much more uh, trustful uh, partner in in the attempt to control this disease than the United States. Uh, if I were, if I was uh, sitting in the government somewhere in in in, in Tanzania or uh, in Nigeria, I would I would listen perhaps more carefully to what Xi Jinping says than to what Donald Trump says. And I think in that way, in in, in the world as it as it looks today, I think that China could be able to actually to 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 be strengthened by this. And I think that again, the way they they in my case of how they handled the WHO w- w- was an illustration of that China actually uh, got a lot out, out of a situation where they actually uh, uh, they could have lost a lot because because they were the epicenter of the epidemic because they did delay information and so on. So, uh, but, but I but I but I think that China. My my guess is, and it's just a guess, but my guess is that China will probably be come out stronger because also because they're offering money. I mean, they're offering money to the world, uh, saying that we let we we will help you. Uh, um, uh, yes, um, that was the first question. Uh, the future of India. I mean, I think that uh, um, I think that you will get through this, and I mean, it 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 can be very tough, and it can be with a severe uh, a loss of life. But if you if uh, and a lot of uh, tragedies. But if you look on it from a larger historical perspective, societies have come through uh, pandemics, which in 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 terms of the number of deaths has uh, has have been much much more severe than this one. And I think that India also with the young population uh, would probably be, uh, be be able to to come out of this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, perhaps even relatively strong. Uh, what will happen to your? Uh, I mean, I I think that even though we might see deglobalization in certain areas, I still think that there will be a lot of um, uh, commodities and services that uh, India can produce in the world in a global world. Also, uh, also in in five or ten years' time, I think that you uh, you there might be a, a, a bright future for the Indian medical industry. I think that. Uh, uh, there might be a not so bright future for your tourist industry, but it is my feeling that the international part of the Indian tourist industry is not very big. I mean, I think it is going to be much worse for a country like Thailand or perhaps Sri Lanka, which I think has a much more uh, is much more dependent on international or intercontinental tourism. So I think that uh, that is a that is a that is an, a sector that is probably going to suffer. But I think that uh, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be very bad in India because my my understanding is that the Indian international tourist industry is not that large. Then the, the most difficult question is the um, the, the relation between this epidemic and modernity uh, and how modernity uh, epidemics have shaped uh, modern, uh, our, our modern lives and our sense of modernity. I, I would be a little cautious to say too much about this because I think it, it, it is perhaps for philosophers to, 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 to say, but I would say one thing, one observation that I've made, uh, and that is based on my experience in Denmark, is that I think that... Um, there's been a rhetoric about the uh, the value of every life and the willingness of in the the wealthy countries at least in the world to spend enormous sums of money saving lives of um, of uh, of people uh, who you can say from a from from a very cynical view uh, are uh, weak lives. Uh, I mean, the the people who actually uh, have died from COVID-19 in my part of the world are typically more than 80 years old. Many of them, as far as I understand the medical discussion, would have uh, died um, uh, within maybe one or two years anyway, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and if you compare for instance to the great influenza in 1918, there there was not this idea about saving every life, no matter the cost. But the point is that if, if you do this rather cynical calculation about economy versus uh, health, uh, we have never spent so much money uh, on saving lives uh, 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 in my part of the world. And I think that is probably something to do with, with the kind of modernity that we are living in, that, 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 uh, that we cannot accept uh, the loss of life and we are going to, we're going to sacrifice uh, 
more than we have ever been willing in history we've ever been willing to earlier in order to save a, any life uh, i think that's all i can say about this very complicated issue and then a world free of pandemics uh, i don't think so i think that and this i think has something to do with what uh, uh, professor nanda asked me about the uh, the anthropocene and i think that uh, deepesh chakrabarty said uh, talk, uh, talk much more uh, uh, cleverly about this that, that, than i'm able to do but uh, there is this link between the presence of coronaviruses not perhaps not only the present one but also the sars uh, virus and uh, the way we are uh, encroaching on uh, nature and the way that we are taking away habitats of 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 of, of uh, wild animals and that we are creating a situation where bats are forced to seek contact with humans to a degree that bats have never been forced to do before i am not an expert on these issues but i just think that we are we are getting into a a period where because uh be, because we are uh, because we are cutting back nature and wildlife and we are getting closer and closer uh, uh, to, to wild animals in the sense where pandemics are probably more likely to 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 occur i think what we can hope is that we would also be better and more alert in dealing with them and that covid-19 could be seen as a wake up call so that we need to be much much more uh prepared uh next time a new virus turns up somewhere in the world and we might be able with the uh, fascinating technologies that we have we might be able not to prevent them from occurring but for uh, cutting them down uh before they become global so they so you can say maybe we can avoid we cannot avoid outbreaks of new epidemic diseases but maybe we can avoid that they become uh pandemics and that again i think would lead to the fifth question i noted down that that takes lot a lot more of international cooperation and the sad thing of course here is that what we need in, in, in today is more cooperation in international health what we have seen is and what what this is what this has illustrated is that the organi the international organization that we have for doing this they're weak the who is a weak organization it has always been a weak organization it is not we can't blame the who for being a weak organization because the who is no not any stronger than the member state would allow it to be and when the who is weak it's because it is poorly funded and because the national states do not want to give up sovereignty to the who they want to decide on health method themselves so if nation states do not want to give more authority and more money to who or similar organizations we will have weak cooperation that is going to be a challenge i think in the immediate future um then i come to chandi's uh, intervention but i was uh, I, I it was a little difficult for me to hear what uh, because there was some problem with this with the sound but i think that i perhaps addressed the issue about the anthropocene and and the nature culture thing and then you said something about the uh, the lockdown and i think that um i mean i think the interesting issue is how for how long can you be in lockdown now in india you've been in lockdown or partial lockdown for a very long time now i mean or and 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 i guess that you are you are approaching a a, a time where you might be saying it, this cannot continue um we i am living in a society where we had lockdown for about 2 months and i think it was terrible but it were even i was lucky because our lockdown was never a complete lockdown you were always allowed to gather 10 people you were allowed to leave your home uh you know i could go uh, jogging or bicycling or whatever all the time i was not allowed to get into work uh, and now we are trying to open up and i think that um um i think what the opening the gradual reopening of our society which is of course also one of the one of the uh, societies with most resources in the world so 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 it 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 is it is not a very universal experience is that it has been surprisingly uh, successful i mean every time we have opened up for this and for that and now you can travel to germany now you can travel to to to, to other countries now you are allowed to uh, go on holiday now you can gather 100 people things like that whatever we have done uh um have uh, we can't see it on the in the statistics so 
it gives us a, at least a, a hope that we that if we if we gradually and wisely reopen our societies and that and we realize that there are certain things that we cannot do i mean the great music festivals where 50,000 people gather and shout each other or sing close to each other i think i mean i don't know when they will come back uh, but we even have uh, we even have uh, sports sports uh, matches now with uh, with with uh, with sort of fifty uh, percent of the capacity in stadiums uh, because and that's it seems to be all right. It seems to be all right because we were able to to get the the the, the level of contagion down to, to a very low level and once you're down there you, you can start to reel. So there's hope that you can have uh, not total lockdowns but 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 but, but part. But, but sort of partial lockdowns, which which can actually work. But uh, I, I think uh, epidemiologists will say will be able to say much more about this uh, th than I do. Uh, I think this was this was the answers that I was able to come up with. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, privacy. Just uh, ask me. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. I now request Ms. Neha Sharma to offer a formal vote of thanks. Neha, please go ahead. Neha, please. Huh? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor and our Chief Speaker, Professor Neil Bimneser, and all the teachers of Ravensa University, and uh, my dear friends, I am extending my vote of thanks uh, to our Chief Speaker, Professor Neil Bimneser for giving such a uh, wonderful lecture on this uh, COVID uh, situation. And uh, I am thankful I'm to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Isan Patr, Professor Isan Patr, sir, for uh, such uh, get his help, his time, and his patience, and his valuable advice uh, and insight of in, for this seminar. I am uh, extending my thanks to uh, our coordinators and teachers of Department of History of Insa University. Um, I'm um, thankful to our technicians and other staff uh, for uh, this uh, for the successful success of this seminar webinar and uh, not uh, i am extending my heartiest thanks to all the participants here present from the teachers to the scholars and the students of undergraduate and postgraduate from different universities uh, for their active participants thank you very much thank you we Thank you, Niels, uh, finally. So we'll look forward to catch up with you uh, yeah. maybe this one after.